Today's guest is Stephen F. Mayer. He's the principal and founder at SF Mayer LLC. All right, Stephen, thank you, thank you for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Ted. It's much appreciated. Yeah. So one of the things that stands out um, in your profile, there's certain certain things I just know nothing about. Um, one one of the uh, the early uh, you know sort of leadership roles you had was with a toll bridge authority. How did you end up there? Well, I, I interesting question. I was uh, my work all up until that point is in the consulting engineering sector. And I saw this ad in the newspaper back then. It was in the newspaper about the Buffalo and Fort Erie Public Bridge Authority, which owns the Peace Bridge and which spans the Niagara River between Buffalo, New York and Fort Erie, Ontario. And I said, I'm going to apply for this job. Well, long story short, there were many people that applied. I went through the interview process. I got the job uh, because and I think what really helped me was not a couple of things, my education, clearly, uh, but also the fact that. I was in the infrastructure business and the Peace Bridge, uh, we refer to it as the Peace Bridge Authority, is very, very interesting. Uh, the, the authority owns the bridge and the plazas in U.S. and Canada. So, and it's a toll bridge, it's self-sustaining, and it also provides facilities for customs and border protection. Back then there was separate customs and separate immigration. Uh, and it's one of the largest crossings in the world for merchandise trade on a peak day you might have $250 million worth of trade crossing uh, the bridge between US and Canada. And it was a wonderful job because it brought in everything from engineering and construction, but it also brought in a lot of what I call business diplomacy and the, having to work with all sorts of partners uh, in Ottawa and Toronto and Albany and Washington DC and the trucking community and uh, uh, duty-free operators. So lot, lot going on at that, lot going on at that crossing. It's a wonderful job. Is there 10 and a half years? Wow. Um, so I was going to ask you, you know, this authority, um, who, who, who are you accountable to as a leader? Like, was there a certain well, branch or... Yeah, it's very interesting. It was formed under a compact in the U.S. Constitution and by the state of New York, because the bridge was originally a private bridge built in 1927 and opened in 1927. But in the early 30s, went into, it was teetering on bankruptcy because of the depression. So New York State, which is not allowed, no state can enter into an agreement with the sovereign without uh, congressional approval. So the U.S. Congress gave the state of New York permission to enter into the Fed with the government of Canada to create the Buffalo and Fort Erie Public Bridge Authority. The authority has 10 members, 10 board members who I reported to, five Canadians which are appointed uh, federally and, and five Americans which are appointed some by the governor, some are ex officio like the Attorney General of New York State the uh, head of the Niagara Frontier Transportation Authority. So, uh, so when politics change, the board members change, uh, change as well. So now it's interesting, if you go downriver past Niagara Falls, there's what's called the Niagara Falls Bridge Commission. They are, it's a separate entity. They operate three bridges. They are a creature of the federal government of the United States and the province of Ontario. So they're the mirror image of us. But so for your, for your viewers and listeners, the nine major crossings in the Great Lakes Basin over the St. Lawrence Rivers, the uh, Niagara River, the Detroit Rivers are all organized differently. And of course, the biggest is the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor, Detroit, which is private. Yeah, so, for sure. So um, they're all interesting creatures, if you will. I know um, you're, you're big on the strategy side and I, you know, I've read you know, many books on strategy and I, I've heard it defined as, you know, you know, being able to get a lot of people or many groups of people to, to work on a very simple focal point and get them to agree. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that's where you learned some of that skill. Yeah, I very, very interesting because I work, uh, like a friend of mine used to say, when you do an international bridge, not only do you have a leg in two countries, but you get to do everything twice. And, <laughs> and uh, it was sort of his, his quote to me, but you, you really have to exercise diplomacy. I mean, a lot of people say, well, Americans and Canadians are the same. That's not true at all. Um, so you deal with different cultures, you deal with even different standards, the metric system versus the English system. And so it gave me, it was really a 
almost a laboratory for me to improve, you know, or to engage, if you will, in what's of real interest to me, engineering, uh, infrastructure, international trade. It all, it all came together at that focal point. And um, yeah, we, and we learned a lot. We also had the advantage at the authority to be, we had, we had the money we needed to do what we wanted to do. And we did some pretty creative, th uh, pretty creative activities there that maybe a total public sector entity or a private sector entity could not do, which was um, really, uh, really delightful. So, Very cool. So from there, yeah, um, where, where did your career progress? Well, from there, I, I left after 10 and a half years and I had been working on my PhD. So I, 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 um, I had a buyout from the bridge. I, I finished my PhD. I actually got my PhD when I was 53 years old. So quite by accident, I ended up at Niagara University and where I ended up staying there for eight years, but I taught mostly the MBA program and I taught three classes, uh, what's called the capstone business strategy, the marketing, uh, or I'm sorry, the uh, international management class. And I did a technology commercialization class, which I really, really enjoyed. While I was there, an engineering firm asked me if I would come to work to them. So for them, and so I ended up doing both. I was part time with the engineering firm, which was almost full time, and full time at the university. The engineering firm I worked throughout the United States, throughout Canada, the Middle East, a little bit in uh, South America as well. Uh, that was a very large firm, about fifteen thousand people. I was in their strategy group. Had the opportunity to do an acquisition there. We bought a firm in uh, in Canada. Actually, the firm was that I worked for was headquartered in uh, Pasadena. They're no longer in Pasadena. They're in Centerville, Virginia. But um, so I really so I got the best of all worlds. Tats. I I taught what I did. So I got to see strategy in in action. And my my PhD research was in strat business strategy. And so I got to actually you know it was applied research. So I got to teach it, I got to do it, and I got to see it applied. So for me, it was a really, a really nice confluence of um, positions and, and, and careers. And then in uh, 2019, I left the engineering firm, and I just do adjunct work now, but I started my own business. And I work with firms on their business strategy. I help them uh, facilitate what we call war rooms, discovery sessions, trying to unearth and uncover the value proposition the clients have. And looking at the entire sales process from say a, a bid document or request for proposal or a product launch, whatever it might be and say, okay, how do we, what are the steps we have to go through? How do we build our advantage such that when we submit say a proposal, we're gonna win this job. Yeah. And I work, that's what I do now. Yeah, I think you 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 qualified that you know the stakes are very high with some of these proposals. You know, investing lots of money, uh, upwards of seven figures into it for jobs that are nine or or ten figures. Um, right. So th these war rooms describe what you do in these ro war rooms to stress test the uh, proposal or the processes. Okay, sure. Um, a couple there, there's different types, but one of them might be where you're doing the in, initial strategizing. So what you'll do there is you'll you'll bring together key members of the team and you'll start to look at say, okay, let's develop our winning themes. What do we think is going to win? Let's let's test it against a SWOT analysis. All your listeners, I'm sure, have done a typical SWOT analysis. I like to also do a pro-con analysis because sometimes a SWOT, you say, okay, I've got a strength, I got a weakness, but what are the pros and cons? Who are our partner firms? Who gives us a distinct advantage as we go forward? So I'll facilitate a lot of those meetings and also uh, be a as dispassionate as I can, an objective uh, entity, if you will, in the room to say, let's not eat a lot of firms can eat their own own cooking you know right away they could say oh we're the best or whatever but you really need to do an objective deep dive into that i'll also facilitate what are called client mapping sessions you know what what points of intersection do our employees have with different members of the the client and how well and how strong is our relationship by the way especially in professional services the number at least in the research i've done and and read the number one source of competitive advantage is relationships. That's yeah. that's number one. Then typically the, the reputation of the firm and the project manager or the point person. 
I'll also do competitive war room sessions where what you do, they have different names. They might be called black cats or, or you know, attack teams or whatever. Uh, black hats just being a metaphor for the bad cowboys rather than the white hats and good cowboys, right? But anyway, <clears throat> the black hat type sessions, you bring in, what you're doing there is you're bringing in members of your own firm that have not been engaged with the, um, with the project, or you might even bring in outsiders. Uh, the outsiders have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, but you bring them in for a six to eight hour session and you have the, the team in the room, out of the room, but the whole goal is for them to attack your approach and try to find, uh, you know, probe it, find problems with it. Uh, you know, is there a weakness here? And the type of thing, have you thought about this? Then after that, working on the proposal, editing, reviewing it. And finally, I do interview coaching where we'll actually do the rehearsals, getting ready for the presentation and all of the media that might go with it. So it might be virtual, you know, reality, augmented reality, simple PowerPoint type things. Um, so that kind of the whole, the whole chain, if you will, but what is really significant is the upfront foundational work you do, where you really do the deep dive into the client uh, value proposition. Yeah. So. Now, uh, there's, there's a lot to unpack there, but I, I, I get the sense when you bring people inside from the firm, I mean, it, it almost feels like they're in for six or eight hours. I mean, do you guys put up bounties to find holes in the proposal? It feels that way. Um, or what's what's what? How do you motivate people to pick apart uh, your teammates' uh, proposals? You know, it's hard to do because one of the things you one of the things you really have to do you have to set your ego at the door. Yeah. You really do. You know, and and because people can come in and say, "What do you mean? That's a great idea." And you. It, it, so what it is is there's a lot of upfront work, a lot of prep work, where you yeah. say, "Look, your job is to come in." And just be objective, be respectful. And, and you lay down a lot of ground rules first about your, your behavior and your performance there, because it's like taking medicine, you know, it may not taste good, but it's good for you type of thing. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people will kind of get defensive, but when the end game is winning the job, that's what, that's the determinant. That's what keeps you on, on message. And the facilitator's role is to keep everybody above the fray, if you will, and just keep, and it's always not about, it's not about the person or their expertise. Mm -hmm. It's about the approach. It's about the product. It's about, and a good facilitation really zeroes in on that. Yeah. So you mentioned a pros and cons analysis above a SWOT analysis. I mean, stylistically yeah. or just philosophically, do you, do you focus on one more than the other in terms of like um, uh, improving strengths or con, uh, pros um, or mitigating uh, weaknesses? Or do you kind of do both? Or how do you think about that? I kind of do both, but let me, I've just started with the pro cons of the, you know, every SWOT analysis has been around for, I don't know, hundred years or whatever, right? And then you flip it on its side to do a toe or on its head to do a toes, right? So you say, how do we take our strengths to uh, mitigate a threat or to capitalize on an opportunity? What I like about pros or cons, you just, you know, you just pick your hypothesis or your prop, you know, your, your, like, here's a good example. Why do we want to partner with this firm? Because most, ent most entities are partnering with somebody. So you say, why do we want, what are the pros of partnering with this firm? What are the cons? Then you say, okay, what are the, what are the pros and cons of not, uh, of not partnering with this firm? I find that to be a little more robust and, and to you're diving into it a little more. And there's one other tool that I like to use. It comes out of the uh, applied strategy. It's called the VRIO analysis under the resource-based view of the firm where you say it's V-R-I-O. V, what's the value proposition of the firm? R means what do you have in your business that's rare or unique? Maybe it's intellectual property, maybe the best scientist in the world, patents, whatever. Um, I, what do you have that's inimitable? And by that, I mean costly or difficult to copy. And do you have the organizational resources and people to pull it all together? If you can, and it comes out of this, it comes out of this whole line of thinking, which says the following, why do firms in the same industry, why do some firms that are all in the same industry do better than others? What is the, what is it that they're, why are they succeeding, holding their position, doing better? And that's really what I looked at when I did my uh, my dissertation. But um, 
because I'm not interested in theoretical activities. I'm interested in applied on the road, roll up the sleeves type stuff. So yeah, and and so those tools are what I like to use. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's very good. Now, um, um, so you talked about relationships earlier, and I, I think it's you know the, the keys. I mean, how far does one of these firms go to either establish relationships or understand how to improve relationships or target um, relationships? Well, the strength the strength of relationships comes from trust, and that trust is really based on it's it's not enough. Well, it is. Competition is so is so intense. A lot of people have good products. A lot of people have good services. But what is it that gives you that? You know, here's here's something that I, I often will use in a, in a presentation. I'll say if you take the top 10 sprinters in the world over the last couple of years, the top 10, and you would erase them all at the same time, what separates the winner from the loser? It's like 13 hundredths of a second. Now, are they good sprinters? They're all good. They're all outstanding. So generally, <clears throat> what separates a firm from uh, the others is that little marginal, what I, the marginal gain, you know, like, like an economist would look at some, and that marginal gain where you can build that relationship, where you're staying close to your client, where you're bringing innovation or unique solutions to that client, where you're, you know, you're always there. And by the way, and if you make a mistake, you own up to it and you correct it because everybody makes mistakes. I don't care who the business is or who the, what, what the firm is. But at the, at the ability to always pay attention, stay in touch, don't just, you know, don't, I, I tell firms, don't be an order taker, don't be the waiter, be the chef, help prepare the menu, you know, help them develop uh, the, the industry I work in, the, a lot of the engineering firms will work at helping develop that capital plan, understanding how those, the, the finances flow, how understanding how it's going to affect their uh, operations. So, and, and like I say, it's trust. And you'll see firms, especially in the industry I come out of, but it's probably true in many firms, where they've, they've used the firm for 20, 30, 40, maybe 100 years. And everyone knows that if you have repeat clients or steady clients, your marketing costs plummet, right? Because you're not always trying to get new work. You're building upon the good reputation of work you've already done. Yeah, so. for sure. Now... So some of these, um, okay, so in marketing or in strategy, um, uh, you know, outside these uh, proposals and, and things, I mean, I saw some, some things on your, your profile. You were talking about vision and all these things. How does that, that all factor into this? Well, you know, I used to think, and maybe <laughs> I, used, I, I used to think that vision and mission statements were a bunch of nonsense. I, I need to be honest and straight about it. But then I started to say, well, wait a minute. Vision and mission statements distill the essence of the firm. When you sit in these sessions and you do them and you people start arguing over the prepositions, the and ah, uh, you say, oh my God, I'm exhausted, right? <clears throat> but you develop, you develop a, a, a collective, if you will, forget the statement, you develop a collective about what you're all about. I'll give you an example. I use this um, and I use a little game to do it. Everyone has put together puzzles. And I think puzzles have been around about 600 years. You'll have them when you're growing up. Your grandparents may have them on the dining room table sitting there. I do a little exercise where I take a group of people and I put eight at a table. Use six or four. It could be up to eight, no more. And I give one group. And the, the puzzles are from the same genre, but they're each different. So And there are 300 pieces. I'll have 25 minutes to do it. And I'll give one group the complete puzzle with the picture. I give another group a similar puzzle it's from the same, it might be a group of cats, but organized differently and same company and all that, but no box top. I'll give the third group a puzzle and I give them, I take away all the edge pieces and I give the fourth group a puzzle where I take away the box top and I make them put finger puppets on their uh, finger puppets on their fingers. And I'll say, go put, and I also put it on a tablecloth. It's very confusing. And I'll say, here's the rules. 25 minutes, whoever gets the most pieces puts together win. Everybody's done puzzles. Tats, I have to tell you, I wrote a paper on this, it got published, but the 
what happens is amazing. It touches all kinds of things. First of all, teamwork. Somebody will say, I'm going to do all the green pieces. I'll do all the blue pieces. I'll, then you get somebody who'll say on the other one group, they'll say, well, we're not, wait a minute, where's the edge pieces? I don't see that because people often start there. And they'll, so they'll say, and they're trying to figure out and they'll say, hey, that looks like the same puzzle. So they'll go look at that puzzle, but it's not the same puzzle, but they don't know that. So um, there's a ta- there's a, there's teamwork that's driven. The other thing is the tablecloth that's confusing represents a confusing environment that we're all in, the externality. But they don't know all they got to do is take it off or flip it over. So they'll all say to me after 25 minutes, you know, you have expectations, and there's a lot more to the game. The the finger puppets are to say a lot of firms have a great vision, but they don't have any resources to do it. They don't give their employees, so they're trying to. So they'll say to me, boy, if I could have taken these finger puppets off, or if I could have, you know, if I would have had a box top or whatever, and I'll say to them, why didn't you ask me? And they'll say, you didn't say we could have them. I said, no, no, no. All I said to you is 25 minutes and you couldn't exchange pieces among them. That, but other than that, so, because what you're really trying to do is you're, get, you're trying to get people to start think and you know, really start to think in a lot of different ways. And everybody knows that is put, I'll say to people, when you put together a puzzle, what do you have in front of you? Everyone has the box top. Everyone does. Because they say, oh, okay, there's the vision. I want to put together the pieces to realize that vision. So uh, that's a fun exercise. It's very old. It's very simple. I just thought of it one, and I've, nobody's ever used it in the past. And I think, gosh, these things, and puzzles have been almost in every culture in the world for a long, long time. Uh, it's a great wait. exercise. It's a lot of fun. Uh, sometimes people get a little frustrated with you, but it's it's fun to do. So I, to me, vision is, yeah, I, you got a statement and I get it. People probably forget it the day after it's done. But sitting down and really trying to craft what the firm is about you know, the real deep, you know, what we're all about, that's very important. Wow. You, you know, as soon as you say, take away the edge pieces, I was just like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I tell people, look, the world doesn't fit in nice boxes. It's got, it's irregular. Your your corporate boundaries, if you will, not physical boundaries, are are ragged. You know, they they touch different points all over the place. They don't fit in nice, convenient little boxes. So, yeah. Wonderful. And, you know, and I'm curious, you, your um, strategy business, you know, obviously you love it and you have fun, but you create poetry, which is interesting. Tell uh, me about that. Yeah, I used, I love, I love poetry. I like the more expressive type poetry that you might see from the age of rom- uh, romanticism, you know, Shelley, Byron, Keats, Edgar Allan Poe, Wordsworth, all the different sort of so one day I just, I, I was, it was, I was writing a Thanksgiving, uh, it was only two years ago. I'm 70 now. So I started at 68 and I wanted, instead of a Thanksgiving blessing, I wanted to write a poem. So I wrote it. It came out really nice. I said, I like this. So I started writing poems about everything I observe. In fact, it's called, I, I, well, I'll get to it in a minute, but so I wrote, I wrote a whole bunch of poems. And then I said, you know what? I'd like to publish this. I said, I'm going to publish a book. Cause I hear from a lot of people that say, Oh, I write too. I should do this. I've always wanted to write a book. So I've, I've always said, I'm going to do it. So I hired an, an artist in Argentina. She did a watercolor illustration for each of my 25 poems. I heard a woman in Spain that did all the layout. I had a local editor who's just a friend of mine. She's fabulous. She did all the editing. Then I wanted to be known as the observant poet. So I hired an IP lawyer who got me a U.S. trademark. In fact, if you Google observant poet, I pop up number one. And I like what I found poetry did for me. So many people are, you know, especially engineers, technicians, uh, uh, technical folks are very much left brained, right? It's very much that logical. The right side brings you that creativity, that look at, you know, language and just culture. And so... I like to observe things without maybe making judgments about them. Maybe it's like mindfulness or whatever. And then I write about it. I'm getting ready to do my second book, but it was a project for me too. And I, so I wrote the book, I got it published, you know, it's on Kindle and on Am- it's on Amazon, you get like a Kindle copy or a, a paper copy. And uh, but although I give away more than I sell, cause I just have great joy in doing it. 
and I'm writing my second one. And like I say, just observe things in life. It could be about grandchildren. It could be about a day in the park. It can be some rhyme, some don't. And I just did a poetry reading. If you were to say to me, uh, open mic, <laughs> if, you were to, if wow. you were to say to me uh, two years ago, I'd be doing that. I'd say, you're out of your mind. I'm never going to do something like that. Uh, I did a book signing when I first wrote the book. And yeah, it's, it's really helped with my writing. I think it's helped to help me with just a broader sense of, of and business it's helped me with as well. You know, it, it really is. I'm glad I did it. I'm looking forward to my next one. I'm also writing a little strategy book that's going to be, I, I hope, witty. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to be working on that too. Yeah. So what's the uh, premise of the strategy book that you're, uh, you're working on? It's going to be, it's, it's good. Uh, it's going to be um, it, some, I think in the titles, here's a working title. It's going to be something like this. Can you make it pizza people want to eat? And then the subtitle is a saucy look at business strategy. I'm going to sort of look, think of the pizza industry, which is when you think about it, there's a pizzeria on every street corner every street corner. And yet local pizzerias compete against the big multinationals and they do quite well. And the question is, how? How do they compete? Well, how do they build their customer base? You know, and how do, what's their business model? Are they just doing delivery? Are they in, in, you know, in restaurant eating or whatever? And I thought that that gives me a nice metaphor to talk about, you know, business strategy, to talk about why they get their repeat customers. And I was going to have some fun with it too. It was going to be, and fairly short, you know, 30 to 50 pages. Um, and, and just based on my observations too, along the way. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, you know, pizza is an area where, you know, if you look at moats or any strategic advantages, um, it's, you know, relatively defined as a commodity. And I love going to uh, businesses that have to compete without these technology or IP um, advantages, but they're still consistently successful because there's definitely a lot to learn when you don't have those barriers up. Right, and think about how think about how pizza really enriches life's activities: pizza parties, pizza to watch sporting events. Uh, hey, let's go out for a pizza and a beer. You know, it's and it's like a universal food. Everybody loves pizza. Well, almost everybody. I don't know many people who who don't. But and they're able to compete against the you know the pizza huts of this world and the Papa John's and the same with coffee shops. I mean, right here I live in the Western New York area, but you got a lot of local shops that compete against Dunkin' Donuts, Starbucks, uh, you know, all the big all the major players, and they have found ways to do it, um, which is and they're and they're very successful. So oh. and I kind of sometimes I kind of like non. I mean, even though I do this technology commercialization class, I like sometimes real simple, real simple, I'll put technologies in quotes. I mean, one project we did, we did a dog leash. We, we, uh, my students looked at it, it, it turns out there was a patent on it, but um, it was a simple, pretty simple item like a dog leash. And um, we've, we've done everything. I'm pretty agnostic about the projects we took. Um, but it, it's interesting to, the other thing I like to see is, are there any old, old products that might be used for one use? And somebody says, hey, wait a minute, we can use this over here, too, and open up a new market for us. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's a whole bunch of accidental products, right, over the years. Exactly. We're in yeah. one market and someone used it the way that they wanted to, and it spun off a whole new category. So it sounds like a very fun project. It is. And I work with my students through the business. And we also affiliate with a, a group of students at, at the other university that has a law school. So I, my students get together on the commercialization and the research piece. The law school students do a patent search. Hey, it's already patented. So maybe your avenue has to be licensing or you know purchasing a patent or, or royalties, whatever it might be. So the student really gets a, it's a roll up the sleeves, dive into it. Type. And of course, many universities do that. So, great. So, I mean, you you work with students a lot, and they must come to you for advice. What do you commonly tell them as advice? Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned. I had one today. I have probably taught, I guess, about two thousand students. I'm guessing, and they'll and they'll often come to me and 
and just to ask, what about this? What about that? The number one thing I do first is I always preface it by saying, I'm not telling you what to do. Mm. Okay. I'm, I'm more asking you questions to help you see where, where you want to go. So it's, it's a couple of things. Um, keep an open mind. Always keep yourself prepared because you don't know when you're going to lose a job, when something's going to happen like that. Have a hobby or a creative side to you that's not strictly business, where you're not engaged in 50, 60, 80 hours a, a week running spreadsheets or economic analyses or whatever. Have a, a, another a life like that of joy and find, and find something like that to do. Um, and, you know, everybody knows about networking. Uh, and I, I do, re I always recommend the societies, like, in, you know, in my case, there's the American Society of Civil Engineers, there's the, you know, but, but I'm also now looking at joining the American Poets Association. <laughs> so something that is totally outside of what I've done for the bulk of my career. And that's, that I'm really looking forward to. So those are just, and, and then I'll, I, you know, it's the old thing in education, the Socratic method, just keep kind of layering down with questions. And I find out that they sort of discover what they want to do by just talking to me and getting together. But I never want to just say, you should do this, you know, it's that that tends not to work. Absolutely. Well, Stephen, what a what a wonderful, um, you know, a bunch of exp experiences you have. Uh, I love your ideas around business and and creativity and, and sort of um, sort of doing both. Um, thank you for sharing. Okay, Tats, thank you. This has been fun.